Chapter Fifteen of The Adventures of Bindle by Herbert Jenkins. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins. Chapter Fifteen: A Billeting Adventure. Somehow or other, Ginger, I feel I'm going to have quite a nappy day. Bindle proceeded to light his pipe with the care of a man to whom tobacco means both mother and wife. "'I don't hold with playin' the fool like you do, Joe,' grumbled Ginger. "'It only gets you the sack.' Bindle and Ginger were seated comfortably on the tailboard of a pantechnicon, bearing the famous name of Harridge's Stores. Ginger had a few days' leave, which he was spending in voluntarily helping his mates with their work. As they rumbled through Putney High Street, Bindle from time to time winked at a girl, or exchanged some remark with a male passerby. For the wounded soldiers taking their morning constitutional, he had always a pleasant word. "'Hullo, matey, how goes it?' he would cry. "Cheerio," would come back the reply. "'Look at him, Ginge, without legs and arms,' Bindle cried, "'and laughin' like hell. There ain't much wrong with a country what can breed that sort of cove.' From the top of the Pantechnicon could be heard Wilkes's persistent cough, whilst Huggles was in charge of the ribbons. As they reached the foot of Putney Hill, Bindle slipped off the tailboard, calling to Ginger to do likewise, and to Wilkes to come down, to save the horses. "'I don't old with walkin' to save horses,' grumbled Ginger. "'I'm tired of being on my feet.' "'You ain't so tired of being on your feet,' remarked Bindle, "'as God is of earin' o' the things what you don't old with, Ginge. Now arf you come, old sport.' Ginger slowly slid off the tail of the van, and Wilkes clambered down from the roof, and the two weary horses were conscious of nearly a quarter of a ton less weight to haul up a tiring hill. Bindle was too popular with his mates for them to refuse him so simple a request as walking up a hill. On Bindle's head was the inevitable cricket cap of alternate triangles of blue and white, which exposure to all sorts of weather had rendered into two shades of grey. He wore his green baize apron, his nose was as cheery and ruddy, and his smile as persistent as ever. At the corners of his mouth were those twitches that he seemed unable to control. To Bindle existence meant opportunity. As he saw it, each new day might be a day of great happenings, of some supreme joke. To him a joke was the anaesthetic which enabled him to undergo the operation of life. Blessed with a wife to whom religion was the be-all and end-all of existence, he had once remarked to her, after an eloquent exhortation on her part to come on the side of the Lord, "'What should I do in heaven, Lizzie? I never heard of an angel what was able to see a joke, and they'd just oof me out. Heaven's a funny place, and I can't be funny in their way. I got to go on as I was made.' "'If you was to smile more, Ginger,' remarked Bindle presently, "'you'd find that life wouldn't hurt so much.' If you can grin, you can bear anything, even Mrs. B, and she takes a bit of bearin'. As the three men trudged up Putney Hill beside the sweating horses, Bindle beamed, Ginger grumbled, and Wilkes coughed. Wilkes was always coughing. Wilkes found expression in his cough. He could cough laughter, scorn, or anger. As he was always coughing, life would otherwise have been intolerable. He was a man of few words, and, as Bindle phrased it, when Wilkie ain't coughin, he's thinkin, and as it hurts him to think, he coughs. Ginger was sincere in his endeavour to discover objects he didn't hold with. Marriage, temperance drinks, Mr. Asquith, twins and women were some of the things that Ginger found it impossible to reconcile with the beneficent decrees of Providence. After a particularly lengthy bout of coughing on the part of Wilkes, Bindle remarked to Ginger, Wilkie's cough is about the only thing I never heard you say you didn't old with, Ginger. It can't help it, was Ginger's reply. No more can't women help twins, Bindle responded. I don't old with twins, was Ginger's gloomy reply. He disliked being reminded of the awful moment when he had been informed that he was twice a father in the first year of his marriage. It's a good job God don't ask you for advice, Ginger, or he'd be up a tree in about two ticks ginger grumbled some sort of reply it's a funny world ginge continued bindle meditatively there's you what ain't appy in your own life and there's poor old wookie a coughin up his accounts all day long after a few moments devoted to puffing contentedly at his pipe bindle continued 
Did you ever hear Ginger, how poor old Wilkie's cough got him into trouble? Ginger shook his head mechanically. Well, said Bindle, he was walking out with a gal, and one evening he coughed rather harder than usual, and she took it to mean that he wanted her to marry him, and now there's eighteen little Wilkies. Ain't that true, Wilkie? Wilkes stopped coughing to gasp. Twelve! Well, well, half a dozen more or less don't much matter, Wilkie, old sport. You lined up to your duty anyhow. Look out for the poplars, Uggles, Bindle called out. Don't go passin' a bit and comin' all the way back. There was a grumble from the front of the van. Two minutes later, Huggles swung the horses into the entrance of the poplars, the London house of Lady Knob Carrick, and the Pantechnicon rumbled its way up the drive. Bindle pulled vigorously at both the visitors' and servants' bells. "'You never knows what you're expected to be in this world,' he remarked. "'We ain't servants, and we ain't exactly visitors. Therefore we pulls both bells, which shows that we're something between the two. Ginger grumbled about not olden with something or other, and Huggles clambered stiffly down from the driver's seat. Presently the door was flung open, and a powdered footman, all plush and calves, as Bindle phrased it, looked superciliously down at the group of men standing before him. "'Mornin', Eustace,' said Bindle civilly. "'We've come.' John regarded Bindle with a blank expression, but made no response. "'Now then, calves, op it,' said Bindle. "'We ain't the war office. We're in a hurry. We've brought the bedsteads and the bedding for the soldiers.' "'You've made a mistake, my man,' was the footman's response. "'We've not ordered any beds for soldiers.' now look here don't be uffy old sport said bindle cheerily or who knows but what you may get yourself damaged like one of them funny-coloured birds in the zoo ain't he ginge when he turned once more to the footman my friend uggles here bindle jerked his thumb in the direction of huggles won the middleweight championship before his nose ran away with him and as for me well i'm what they calls the white ope bindle made a pugilistic movement forward john started back suddenly producing a paper from his pocket bindle read lady knob carrick the poplars putney hill sixteen bedsteads bedden etc is this lady knob carrick's old son this is her ladyship's residence replied john very well continued bindle with finality we brought her sixteen beds bedden etc there's an ell of a lot of etc so you'd better look slippy and go find out all about it if you wants to get orf to see your gal tonight the footman looked irresolute. "'Wait here for a moment,' he said, "'and I'll ask Mr. Wilton.' He half-closed the door, which Bindle pushed open and entered, followed by Wilkes, Ginger, and Huggles. A minute later the butler, Mr. Wilton, approached. "'What is the meaning of this?' he inquired. "'The meaning of this, your royal Highness, is that we've brought sixteen bedsteads, bedden, etc. There's an ell of a lot of etc. as I told calves.' for to turn the old bird's drawing-room into billets for soldiers, as per instructions according to this ear, and he held out the delivery note to Mr. Wilton. There must be some mistake, replied the butler pompously, taking the document. There ain't no bloomin' mistake on our part. All you got to do is to let Cav show us where the drawing-room is, and we'll do the rest. Here's the delivery note, and when it's in the delivery note, it's so. That's Erridge's way. Ain't the old bird told you nothing about it? he inquired. Mr. Wilton took the paper and subjected it to a careful scrutiny. He read all the particulars on the delivery note, then, turning it over, read the conditions under which Harridge's did business. After a careful inspection of Bindle, he returned to a study of the paper in his hand. "'John, ask Mrs. Smarlings to step here,' he ordered the footman. John disappeared swiftly. "'Oh, I forgot,' said Bindle. "'Got a note for you, I have.' And he drew a letter from his breast-pocket addressed to Mr. Wilton, care of Lady Knob Carrick, the Poplars, Putney Hill, Southwest. With great deliberation, Mr. Wilton opened the envelope and unfolded the quarto sheet of note-paper on which was written, "'By the instructions of Lady Knob Carrick, we are sending herewith goods as per delivery note. It is her ladyship's wish that these be installed by our men in her drawing-room.' which it is her intention to turn into a dormitory for billeting soldiers. Our men will do all the necessary work. As Mr. Wilton finished reading the note, Mrs. Marling sailed into the room. She was a woman of generous build, marvellously encased in black silk, with a heavy gold chain around her neck from which hung a cameo locket. Mr. Wilton handed her the letter in silence. 
she ferreted about her person for her glasses which after some trouble she found placing them upon her nose she read the communication slowly and deliberately having done so she handed it back to mr wilton her ladyship hasn't said anything to me about the matter she said in an aggrieved tone nor to me either said mr wilton mrs marling sniffed as if there was nothing in her mistress not having taken mr wilton into her confidence here come along boys cried bindle they don't seem to want these ere goods we'd better take em back keep us here all day at this rate this remark seemed to galvanize mr wilton into action you had better do as you have been instructed he said this he felt was a master stroke by which he avoided all responsibility he could truthfully say that he had not given orders for the bedsteads and bedding to be brought into the house from that moment mr wilton's attitude towards the whole business was one of detached superiority which seemed to say here is a matter about which i have not been consulted i shall merely await the inevitable catastrophe which i foresee and as becomes a man endeavour to render such assistance as i can in gathering up the pieces with great dignity he led the way to the drawing-room on the first floor followed by bindle ginger and john mrs marlings disappeared again into the shadows from which she had emerged once in the drawing-room ginger began to disembarrass himself of his coat and with incomparable gloom proceeded to roll it up and place it upon the mantelpiece beside the ormolu clock mr wilton stepped forward quickly not there my man he said ginger looked around with an expression on his face that caused mr wilton instinctively to recoil it was in reality to ginger's countenance what to another man would have been a reluctant and fugitive smile mr wilton however interpreted it as a glance of resentment and menace seeing his mistake bindle stepped immediately into the breach he's a bit difficult is ginger he said in a loud whisper it sort of irks him to be called my man that sensitiveness of his as made more than one widow he means well though does ginger he just wants andlin like a wife perhaps you ain't married yourself sir mr wilton drew himself up hoping to crush bindle by the weight of his dignity but bindle had turned aside and was proceeding to attend to his duties removing his coat he rolled up his shirt-sleeves and walked to the window better take the stuff in from the top of the van he remarked it'll save old calves from cleaning the stairs ere he called down to huggles back the van up against the window mr wilton left the room indicating to john that he was to stay bindle and ginger then proceeded to pile up the drawing-room furniture in the extreme corner they wheeled the grand pianoforte across the room drew from under it the carpet which was rolled up and placed beneath chairs were piled up on top bindle taking great care to place matting beneath in order to save the polish at the sound of the van being backed against the house bindle went to the window ere what the ell are you doin he cried looking out hold her up hold her up you old luggins do you want to go through the bloomin window look what you done to that tree that'll do steady on steady you didn't ought to have charge of two goats uggles let alone orses here come on up bindle returned to the work of making room for the bedsteads suddenly he paused in front of john yes he remarked critically you look pretty but i'd love you better if you was a bit more useful what about a drink i like a slice of lemon in mine but ginger'll have a split soda suddenly huggles voice was heard from without hi joe he cried hello responded bindle going to the window where's the ladder came huggles question where do you suppose it is uggles why in wilkie's waistcoat pocket of course and bindle left it at that just as huggles head appeared above the window mr wilton re-entered i have telephoned to the harridges he said her ladyship's instructions are quite clear there seems to be no mistake there ain't no mistake old sport said bindle confidently it's all down in the delivery note the old bird has sort of taken a fancy to soldiers and wants to have a supply on the premises huggles had climbed in through the window and was being followed by wilkes suddenly bindle went up to mr wilton and in a confidential voice said jerking his thumb in the direction of john if you wants to see something what'll make you happy you just make calves whistle or um ginger your barmy then you'll see what'll happen you'll die a laughing you will really for a moment mr wilton looked incomprehendingly from bindle to ginger then appreciating the familiarity with which he had been addressed by a common workman 
he turned and with great dignity walked from the room on the balls of his feet ginger watched him with gloomy malevolence i don't old with ruddy waiters like him he remarked all right ging never you mind about dicky bird you get on with your work bindle picked up wilkes hat a battered fawn bowler with a mourning band and placed it upon the head of the late sir benjamin biggs lady knob carrick's father whose bust stood on an elaborate pedestal near the window he's on the bust now all right grinned bindle as he regarded his handiwork in the space of twenty minutes the room was bare but for an enormous pile of furniture in one corner soon sections of small japanned bedsteads and bundles of bedding appeared mysteriously out the window and were hauled in by bindle and ginger after the bedsteads and bedding there appeared four baths these were immediately followed by four tin wash handstands and basins a long table two looking-glasses half a dozen towel horses and various other articles necessary to a well-ordered dormitory throughout the proceedings wilkes's cough could be heard as a sort of accompaniment from without there's one thing ging remarked bindle there ain't much chance o' mislayin' poor old wilkie that cough of his is as good as a bell round his neck at twelve o'clock work was knocked off wilkes entered through the window carrying a frying-pan and huggles with a parcel wrapped in newspaper ginger and bindle both went down the ladder the first named returning a minute later with a parcel also wrapped in newspaper from his parcel huggles produced a small piece of steak which he proceeded to fry at the fire ginger in turn unfolded from its manifold wrappings a red herring sticking this on the end of his knife he held it before the bars soon the room was flooded with a smell of burning red herring and frying steak when bindle entered a minute later he sniffed at the air in astonishment what the ell are you up to he cried here ginger chuck that thing on the fire as for you uggles you ought to be ashamed of yourself ain't you never been in a drawing-room before i'm surprised at him and you uggles that i am ginger chuck that thing on the fire he commanded huggles muttered something about it being his dinner hour i don't old with wastin food began ginger i don't care what you old with ging you got to chuck that soldier on the fire it's only an erring began ginger yes but it's got the stink of a whale cried bindle reluctantly ginger removed the sizzling morsel from the end of his knife and threw it on the fire just as mrs marlings entered she gave a little cry as the pungent smell of huggles and ginger's dinners smote her nostrils oh she cried starting back whatever has happened what a dreadful smell where can it it's ginger forgot hisself mum explained bindle with a withering glance in the direction of his subordinate he thought he was in an undugout. you see mum ginger ain't happy in his own life but but look it's on the fire cried mrs marlings pointing to ginger's dinner at which he was gazing with an expression that was a tragedy of regret when excited mrs marlings had some difficulty with her aspirates oh mr winton she cried to the butler who entered at that moment and stood regarding the scene as achilles might have viewed the reverses of the greeks oh mr wilton take it away please hit will poison us with his head held well in the air mr wilton beckoned to john who walked to the fireplace with a majestic motion of his hand mr wilton indicated to the footman that ginger's offending dinner was to be removed gravely john took up the tongs deliberately gripping the herring amidships and turned towards the door holding it aloft as if it were some sacred symbol ginger's eyes were glued to the blackened shape it ain't every red herring what has a funeral like that remarked bindle to ginger mr wilton threw open the door suddenly john started back and retreated the herring still held before him all smell and blue smoke old me orris murmured bindle who was in a direct line with the door if it ain't the old bird lady knob carrick entered followed by miss strint her companion and echo casting one annihilating look at the speechless john she gazed with amazement at the disorder about her miss strint gave vent to a spasmodic giggle which lady knob carrick did not even notice her gaze roved round the room as if she had found herself in unexpected surroundings finally her eyes fixed themselves on mr wilton wilton what is that john is holding lady knob carrick prided herself on her self-control all eyes were immediately turned upon john who shivered slightly it is what they call a herring a red herring my lady responded wilton poor people eat them i believe and what is it doing in my drawing-room 
demanded lady knob carrick with ominous calm it was smellin mum broke in bindle and we was gettin calves to take it out it's all through ginger he likes tasty food but he ain't appy hold your tongue said lady knob carrick turning to bindle and withering him through her lorgnettes she turned once more to her major-domo wilton she demanded what is the meaning of this outrage it's the billets my lady the what the billets my lady i haven't ordered any billets what are billets suddenly her eye caught sight of the bust of the late sir benjamin biggs who did that rage had triumphed over self-control all eyes turned to the marble lineaments of the late sir benjamin's features never had that worthy knight presented so disreputable an appearance as he did with huggles hat stuck upon his head at a rakish angle it must have been one of the workmen my lady mr wilton tiptoed over to the bust and removed the offending headgear placing it on a bundle of bedding one of the workmen stormed lady knob carrick is everybody mad what is being done with my drawing-room bindle stepped forward we come from arages mum with the beds and things for the soldiers for the what demanded her ladyship for the soldiers billets mum explained bindle you're going to billet sixteen soldiers here billet sixteen soldiers almost screamed her ladyship red in the face with great deliberation bindle pulled out the delivery note from behind his green baize apron and read solemnly lady knob carrick the poplars putney ill that's you mum ain't it lady knob carrick continued to stare at him stonily sixteen bedsteads bedding four baths four washing stands etc there's a rare lot of etceteras mum fit up bedsteads and drawing-room for billeting soldiers carefully storing at one end of room existin furniture there ain't no mistake said bindle solemnly it's all on this ere paper which was handed to me by the foreman this morning there ain't no mistake mum really but i tell you there is a mistake cried lady knob carrick angrily i have no intention of billeting soldiers in my drawing-room well mum said bindle shaking his head as if it were useless to fight against destiny it's all down here on this ere paper and if your lady knob carrick he referred to the paper again of the poplars putney hill then you want these soldiers sure as eggs perhaps you've forgotten he added with illumination forgotten what demanded lady knob carrick forgotten that you want sixteen soldiers mum how a sharp snapping sound from without everybody turned to the window the situation had become intensely dramatic bindle walked over and looked out then turning to lady knob carrick he said triumphantly here's the sixteen soldiers mum so there ain't no mistake the what demanded lady knob carrick looking about her helplessly the sixteen soldiers with all their kit said bindle oh, i counted em he added as if to remove any glimmer of doubt that might still exist in lady knob carrick's mind is everybody mad lady knob carrick fixed her eyes upon wilton wilton looked towards the door which opened to admit john who had seized the occasion of the diversion to slip out with ginger's dinner the soldiers my lady he announced there was a tremendous tramping on the stairs and a moment afterwards fifteen soldiers in the charge of a sergeant streamed in each bearing his kit bag rifle etc the men gazed about them curiously the sergeant looked bewildered at so many people being grouped to receive them after a hasty glance round he saluted lady knob carrick then he removed his cap the men one by one sheepishly following suit i hope we haven't come too soon your ladyship lady knob carrick continued to stare at him through her lorgnettes wilton stepped forward there has been a mistake her ladyship cannot billet soldiers the sergeant looked puzzled he drew a paper from his pocket and read the address aloud lady knob carrick the poplars patney hill will billet sixteen soldiers in her drawing-room she will also cater for them cater for them almost shrieked lady knob carrick cater for sixteen soldiers i haven't ordered sixteen soldiers i'm very sorry said the sergeant but it's it's the man looked at the paper he held in his hand i don't care what you've got there said lady knob carrick rudely strength lady knob carrick had suddenly caught sight of miss strint yes my lady responded miss strint did i order sixteen soldiers demanded lady knob carrick in a tone she always adopted with servants when she wanted confirmation no my lady not as far as i know lady knob carrick turned triumphantly to the sergeant and stared at him through her lorgnettes you hear she demanded 
yes my lady i hear said the sergeant respectful but puzzled don't you think mum you could let em stay insinuated bindle seeing that all the stuff's here let them stay lady knob carrick regarded bindle in amazement let them stay in my drawing-room she pronounced the last four words as if bindle's remark had outraged her sense of delicacy they wouldn't be doing no harm mum if no harm cried lady knob carrick gazing indignantly at bindle through her lorgnettes soldiers in my drawing-room if it wasn't for them mum said bindle dryly you'd be avin soldiers in your bedroom uns he added significantly lady knob carrick hesitated she was conscious of having been forced upon rather delicate ground and she prided herself upon her patriotism suddenly inspiration seized her she turned on bindle fiercely why are you not in the army she demanded with the air of a cross-examining counsel about to draw from a witness a damning admission bindle scratched his head through his cricket cap he was conscious that all eyes were turned upon him answer me commanded lady knob carrick triumphantly why are you not in the army bindle looked up innocently at his antagonist you got various veins in your legs mum he lowered his eyes to lady knob carrick's boots how how dare you gasped lady knob carrick aware that the soldiers were broadly grinning and that every eye in the room had followed the direction of bindle's gaze because continued bindle quietly when you have various veins in your legs you ain't no good for the army i went on trying till they said they'd run me in for wasting time i seen him the remark came from ginger who finding that he had centred upon himself everybody's attention looked extremely ill at ease bindle looked across at him in surprise impulse with ginger was rare with flaming face and murderous eyes lady knob carrick turned to the sergeant you will remove your sixteen soldiers and take them back and say that they were not ordered as for you she turned to bindle you had better take all these things back again and tell harridge's that i shall close my account and i shall sue them for damages to my drawing-room and with that she marched out of the room at a word from the sergeant the men trooped out putting on their caps and grinning broadly bindle scratched his head took out his pipe and proceeded to fill it signing to his colleagues to get the beds and bedding down to the van back march the short sharp order from below was followed by a crunch of gravel and then the men broke out into a song here we are here we are here we are again bindle went to the window and looked out as the sound died away in the distance the question are we downhearted was heard followed immediately by the chorus reply no my ain't them boys just it muttered bindle as he withdrew his head and proceeded with the work of reloading the van two hours later the van was grinding down putney hill with the skid pan adjusted ginger had gone home wilkes was on top and bindle sat on the tailboard smoking well he got ome all right on the old bird to-day remarked bindle contentedly my ain't he a knockout for his little joke beats me does mr little and i takes a little bit a beatin end of chapter fifteen read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california shaggybark.blogspot.com